Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the producer, Susan Haskins. Terrific new musical on Broadway, Billy Elliot at the Imperial Theatre, based on the very popular and wonderful movie. And we are very delighted to have with us tonight the man who wrote the movie, who wrote the book to the musical and the lyrics, Lee Hall. Welcome to Theatre Talk. Hello. And congratulations on the success of what's become for you, uh, I guess, a kind of cottage industry of Billy Elliot. It's very odd. It's very odd to be here, I guess, because it was about about 13 years since I wrote the film script um, and it just keeps going on and on. <laughs> <laughs> was it a story that you began with, a, a short story or was it the, the script first? No, I just, um, I had this image, I was in the bath one day, mm -hmm. I had this image of uh, a little boy in a tutu running along a back street in the northeast where I grew up and um, and I thought, oh my god, this, this is a story and I sat down and started working it out and I immediately saw it as a film. So. Um, so you started writing it as dialogue, not as a you know, not as a work of prose uh, initially. Um, no, no, no. It was. Uh, I guess I, it, I created a, a load of images because it's a very visual. Mm -hmm. When I got the the, the landscape of it, it it, uh, it sort of started to write itself, and I realised it would be set during the strike, which was a big part of my growing up. The miners' strike. The miners' strike. Yeah. yeah. In England in the 1980s. Yeah, 1984. It, it was. It was a huge. Um, it was as close as we came to a civil war because there were literally people down the road fighting every day about whether they were going to keep these pits open or not. Mm. And uh, it was such a vivid part of of my growing up. And mm. it seemed that it was a, a neat story because it happened over a year, and that seemed a, a, a neat uh, envelope to to construct this other story inside. Why the image of a ballet dancer? I mean, you, you, were you a, a dancer yourself as a kid? Were you interested in dance? No, no, not at all. I, I, I think it was, be, it, it sort of, it was a very clear image about being different and artistic aspiration. I, I was always interested in reading and writing and things like that. and was always kind of pilloried by the people around me. Nobody understood what on earth that was. Mm -hmm. Everybody was a puff if you did that, you know, and it was very... Even uh, if you're a writer. It, oh, yeah, especially if you're a writer. I mean, it was kind of, you know, it was all just the other, you know. They, were, the other. they were scared of it and didn't like it. And, um, and so I wanted to kind of write about that. I thought it was an interesting thing because it, it, it was a, sort of a bit of a struggle being just interested in, in, in reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess dancing is more... Dancing more a little more visual, a little more yeah, dramatic yeah, than yeah, if I the kid just, you know, yeah. is in the library. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think exactly. you have a musical on Broadway that's got an advance of $15 million if uh, the kid wanted to be a librarian. <laughs> I wanted uh, to, to, to tell us a little bit more, though, about your, your uh, growing up in this period. You, you were up in Newcastle. Yep. How important was the trade union movement to, to your community when you were growing up? Um, it was kind of incredibly dominant. The whole, where I grew up, everybody that I knew voted for the Labour Party. Any, any man who worked would be a part of the trade union. It was kind of, you couldn't think outside that box. Was your father in the, in the trade union? Um, weirdly, <laughs> weirdly he wasn't, but he'd worked in the shipyards and then he worked for himself being a house painter. Uh -huh. um, so, so there wasn't a union of that, but had had there been, he would have been in it. Mm -hmm. um, but my grandfather was a big trade unionist. He was a what they call the shop steward who who ran the the trade union for his factory. Uh, so it was just, but it, it wasn't remarkable because everybody did the same. I only really remarked on it when I kind of left and realised how how strange it was. It was kind of an I another country really. Now, how did you get out of there? 
I got out of there. I think I was very lucky because uh, and none of our family had gone to university, had an education, or nobody was interested in in arts at all. We didn't even play musical instruments. And uh, during the sixties and seventies, a lot of educated, I guess, hippies of that generation came to the northeast uh, to kind of like liberate people like me, uh -huh. I suppose. And they, and so at school was a very, very rich atmosphere of doing music and drama and putting on plays and it was part also of a political education of, of the kids um, so, so that art and politics were absolutely the same thing in, in, in education so I just got really interested through school you put that there and um, uh, but it was very strange you know that, that uh, the resistance uh, from most of the other kids from, from other the parents? adults yeah, and, um, and my parents just didn't understand. They thought it was just weird. Why am I <laughs> reading all these books? Why am I interested in plays? Um, they couldn't understand it at all. And it wasn't until, you know, more recently that they... I think they just thought it, there's no way somebody from this background is ever going to be able to do it as right. a writer. So, or, I, I, in the end of Billy Elliot, the movie, the father, the family comes to resolution of, of mm. embracing and appreciating do you think that could have happened? Really? That they would, when they embrace and appreciate the... Well, family? it happened to me. Mm -hmm. that, that was my story. Yeah, that yeah. I, can, I guess I guess I kind of educated my parents in Good. a way. And, and but, but, I mean, and you know. There's a, well, a wonderful movie, uh, it, it, moment in the movie when the Billy gets into the ballet and the father comes running up over the hill, jumping around. Was there a, that kind of moment for you with your parents where they realized our son is a writer and he's written something that is astonishing to us. I suppose it was a bit earlier than that because it's a sort of fantasy autobiography. I mean, none of it is literally true, sure, but all sure. of it is emotionally true. Yeah. Um, and I decided when I was about 17 that I needed to do something with this interest and because the, the sort of thought was I would go and work with my dad. Yeah. That most people did and and I decided that I wanted to go to university so I thought oh pick Cambridge that's a good university so <laughs> not um, a bad choice <laughs> and um, and that is so my ballet school was Cambridge University and I kind of you know and the day I got in was that moment really ah. because they couldn't quite believe it I didn't quite believe that um, so that wait let happen. me ask you that because you've got the other wonderful scene of Billy Elliot when the letter arrives from the Royal Ballet and it's sort of sits, I think if I'm, it sits on the table, right, for a while, they're sort yeah, of yeah. afraid to open it. Did that happen to you with your parents when the acceptance letter came in from Cambridge? Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that's, that, that, I guess that's possibly the most autobiographical bit of it. But, um, uh, yeah. My favorite character in Billy Elliot, though, is, 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 is the broken down old ballet teacher. Uh, and you know, who, who mm -hmm. just gives everything to this point. Did you have someone like that in your life, a, a teacher who, who, I didn't have teachers who were so broken down. <laughs> well, no, I, I speak as a, I speak as a broken down teacher myself. But but you know, but that she that she that she was so invested and, and became his mother in a sense to, to get him through. Yeah, I th I think I was really privileged because I didn't have just one. There were a, a two or three people who really took an interest in me, um, way beyond their job as a teacher, and. You know, I used to go to their home. They used to, you know, give me things to read, take me to see things. I d it was so. This character was a distillation. Then. A distillation yeah. of all those things uh, and all those people. And um, but I think it's kind of unthinkable now that um, that would happen because there's all this kind of separating education from life. Isn't and that, all that a shame? Thing. Yeah. And and uh, I, I was just so lucky that it was a sort of freer time. I think and teachers would be reluctant to take any kid, you know, home or off the premises of the school now or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I certainly wouldn't happen. I, 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 I want to touch on the political dimension of Billy Elliot because it is, um, uh, you know, a fiercely um, anti-Thatcher, anti-conservative government statement, very much pro-trade union. However, though, looking back, coming from that world of the trade, trade union movement, the argument can be made that the trade unions had a real stranglehold, a, a lock on the economy of Great Britain, and that that power was abused, and that they had to be, they had to be broken. Do you hold any truck with that argument? Do you see Thatcher's point of view at all, that the trade union movement was abusive, was too powerful, and had to be stopped? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> Even that now you're a rich and famous screenwriter and living in a lovely apartment in London, you have no sympathy with the, with the, the conservatives. Um, I, n no, I think they completely misunderstood the, what, what the problems were. Um, uh, I, I think. I think what happened was that there was an, an inevitable shift from a, a industrial economy that's, that's happened everywhere to yeah. a, a service economy that was that was happening because of, of what's now called globalization. They didn't say that at the time. Um, and but the management of that, which clearly things had to change, was just they threw out the baby with the bathwater yeah. and they attacked the wrong thing and. I think we in Britain we really suffer the consequences now. It's only really now when it's really bitten in. And I think even the rhetoric of Thatcher has uh, seems kind of soft <laughs> compared to even what our governments sometimes do now. Well, yeah. Stephen Daldry told us now that that area is, you know, has the highest heroin rate in the in the country. And These that, former areas that, that were coal mining places. And the, 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 the Thatcher's disregard for the welfare of the people who were going to be involved in this has. Has borne fruit of oh no, it, 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 it's 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 been devastating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the time, you could, you see, I, I came from a not not only did the unions uh, were looking after their own workers, that that political understanding. For instance, there was the cooperative movement, which were in the northeast. So you went to get your groceries at a shop. That you partly owned, right. and your groceries were cheaper, and you got free things because the profits were brought back. Um, for instance, and there are many, many other ways in which the the union movement was part of a bigger political movement, which was about self-help and uh, protection of, and and it, it, it was it was that culture and that political ideology that Thatcher needed to smash. So you could have rampant consumerism. Everybody's individual. You know, nobody's helping themselves in this way. And and, and look where we she, are. <laughs> <laughs> and look where we are. And so, like, it's so, it seems weirdly so timely that this, yeah. uh, in my lifetime, it, it was about the moment where actually that came to be a physical battle. I mean, in the the, the play, we we show that yeah, you've uh, got the, the police riots. and the miners and a riot. Going and, on. and this was a daily thing that happened over a, over a year. That. People's houses were smashed up. People were arrested. People were people just doing their job, or in fact, not doing their job. People going on strike were, were literally beaten up. But what was in the mind of the police? Just that was their job too. Well, that that was the job, and that that, that during that the Thatcher moment, that we were living in sort of two countries: the North, the industrial heartland, uh, was a completely different country. That, that at that time. Um, you know, there were three million unemployed people, which was a massive percentage, biggest since the 30s in um, in, in England. And um, but it was at the same time as what we call the yuppies in London, and the you know the the, the growth of the stock market and all, you know all of the things. The city was exploding. Then. Yeah, exactly. So and and great wealth and um, prosperity f for some in the south wow. and so so it was a, a very very uh, polarized uh, environment but the political agenda as i've said was was ideological you know milton friedman you know uh, yeah. monetarist yep. uh, and and that but it, it physically meant a battle on your doorstep <laughs> yeah, it yeah. had this manifestation which why it became a very interesting thing to write about but also, I think that it doesn't. Hopefully, its political allegiance and analysis is relatively clear. But um, I problematize the nature of that society that I grew up in because it was homophobic, macho, you know, small-minded, all these other things. That so it, it's not that that culture was perfect uh, and blissful. Yeah, and, indeed, yeah, yeah. and and that that's as a dramatist that's. Right, the tension there is. You, you, well, what? As, as, as our now President Obama said, and he was criticized for this, that, that people, when they're frustrated, become bitter and they cling to things like, he said, guns and macho things, but that, that, that people in, in their despair will cling to these. these yeah, absolutely. Things. But what's interesting, you could have written a piece, though, which was 
really turning your back on this community of homophobic, narrow-minded people. You could have put them down, but that's not what Billy Elliot's about. Mm -mm. It's about these people, my little interpretation, recognizing that their community, their way of life is over. But this boy is going to go on to something they can't even imagine, but he will carry with him the good things about that community. I think that be weirdly became clearer as time's gone on, mm -hmm. that, that that was a theme about it were the theme of loss and the theme of this big sort of economic change. Because when we were at the movie, there were still pits. Mm. Uh, the pits is the, the British word for mines. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, by the time we came around to making the musical, they literally shut them all. And I think there's a. Th there used to be 300,000 people directly going underground um, in 1984. Now there are less than a thousand in the whole of Britain uh -huh. um, and so that's a profound shift um, in such a small country in a, a country that had depended on the natural resources of coal for well, since the industrial revolution yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and and in such a short space of time um, uh, but that that that's been a process that's been happening for over the 20 years and uh, it's, it's ac it accelerated just as we were writing. And the you end the musical and, and the movie very differently, and that explained it. Yeah, yeah. and, and, so, and yeah. so it it became clearer what it was about. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And, and why why we had all been getting our hands dirty in this this thing, and and I think the theme of loss on many levels uh, resonates became, more now. Yeah, I uh, want to uh, elevate this discussion, Elton John. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's the composer of Billy Elliot. Um, what, I'm always curious because I, I know people who have written musicals with Elton before, and working with Elton is kind of an interesting thing because Elton is often not anywhere near you when you're when you're writing things, since he's in Vegas and touring and doing this and the other thing. What's it like to write a musical with? A worldwide pop superstar who's not, you know, holed up in a hotel room with you, banging out songs every day. Well, it was blissful, really, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I think what's great about him is that he's absolutely intuitive. You know, he he um, he just understands what he needs to do. And what we did was talk a lot around what it could be and when I read because I, I was very cagey about it because I made the film I uh, thought of it as a film and I didn't understand quite how it would work on, on a stage um, uh, and when we talked when we talked about it I realized that what informs so much of his music was popular traditions that weren't necessarily just rock and roll that he uses an awful lot a lot of his but he says if you want to write a good ballad write a hymn Mm. And when I realized that subconsciously, he, when he, he writes, he does draw on all these different traditions of music, which have an awfully long history. Um, and I realized that he would be able to write a, a score which used the indigenous uh, music of this community. So he, he, he understood, he just, because he's got such an absolute. Catholic range of taste, mm. and so he he just knows about folk music. He knows about the Wesleyan hymnal tradition. He knows about, and so he's got this at his fingertips without even considering it. So when I realised he could do that, it became very simple to to understand what the musical should be, mm. and hopefully it's in a tradition that we work in from uh, the theatre workshop with Joan Littlewood, who probably is best known. Here for oh what a lovely war yeah yeah we yeah. talked about um, Stephen Dolby when he was on yeah that, um, that working class tradition of theatre the every man's yeah. theatre every man's theatre but uh, using the cu the cultural objects of those communities that you're representing mm. so uh, and uh, and that's what we do in Billy Elliot that there's a there's a folk song and there's there's hymnal songs there's the political songs um, and, and and even in those traditions to to have the 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 rock and roll pub band yeah, kind yeah, of thing yeah. that, and we do a couple of those things that, but they're all kind of integrated formally and thematically in a way um, that helped me say what I was trying to say. Yes, and you, you, you didn't try to stick to the scenario of the film in ter on a scene-by-scene -scene basis. You really broke it open with the music and completely reconceived how all the emotional moments would be realized. 
Yeah, it was a great opportunity because you can. What's great about theatre is that you can do more than one thing at a time. <laughs> and you know, and, and I think where we'll, we've been most successful is when we have many things happening yeah. at a time, narratively, emotionally, choreographically, choreographically yeah. Yeah. and puppets. And puppets. <laughs> um, but, but, now, when you were working with Elton, though, did you did, would he send you a, a theme and then you'd write the lyrics, or would you sketch out a song, do the lyrics, and then send them, you know, via fax or email? To him, uh, he was ins the one thing he was insistent on is that uh, we write it in order, uh, and the order of the way the songs will yes, fall in the show, which I thought was very smart. And uh, he uh, he really only writes to he can only write if he's got a lyric, mm. and sometimes he doesn't like a ly lyric. But he doesn't ask you to change it. He just says, we're not going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happens you know, if you like your lyric, though? Um, well, but I think he, well, he's, a very, he's got very good taste. And, uh, and, uh, but I would write a thing, and then I would fax it to him if he was in Atlanta, uh, where he wrote, we wrote the first half when he was in Atlanta. And um, so I'd fax it in the morning. Um, and come evening, he would ring me up and say, Listen to this, and he would play <laughs> it down the phone, um, and it was a surreal and fantastic experience to sort of you know, get such an immediate feedback on, on, on. So it didn't really matter that there was the distance between us. And this, the second half we wrote in London, it was the same thing. Mm. Really, I'd come in in the morning with a, a song, a lyric, and then he would wait until he understood what to do. He writes incredibly fast when he does it, but. It's an awful long time to, to just get to the point right. where he, he feels that he knows what to do. Now, if though if, if he can say, um, you know, I don't like this lyric, we're not going to do that, can you say to Elton John, eh, not crazy about that tune, we're not going <laughs> to do that? <laughs> Does it work both ways? Um, well, we, there, were, there were two or three so songs that didn't fit um, into, the, uh, into the drama of it. Um, it's quite long as it is. <laughs> um, but I think what was brilliant is that I, I think we had a very good report and it, uh, he, we intuitively understood each other. Mm -hmm. And he, he completely got whatever I was trying to do. Um, uh, I think it's because it, Billy is, is, is as much his story as it is mine. Yeah. I mean, it's. He was the quite... misfit kid who was an artist who was gay and had to get out of, I believe he grew up in a working class yeah, environment and, as well. And and his uh, Royal Ballet School was the Royal College of Music and he used yeah. to go there when he was a teenager just the same, get these special lessons and so he just understood it, you know. So it was a really, from my point of view, easy relationship um, because we were both singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. We've only got a couple of minutes left, but I do want to touch on a play that you've written. Um, it's at the National Theatre in London, and I hope we'll see it here, called The Pittman Painters. I was fortunate enough to see it in London. It's a terrific play. Can you just tell us what, what that's about? I discovered there were a group of um, miners who, in the 1930s, hired the professor of art from the local university in Newcastle um, to teach them art history and painting and so they used to go down the mines during the day and once a week at night they would have this guy come in and um, teach them about art and um, they they discovered they were quite good and <laughs> we, but within a couple of years they were um, exhibiting their work in London they were um, collected by some of the most important collectors of modern art at the time and it's really about that they decided that they wouldn't become professional, and they could have easily become professional, mm. and they they remain miners. They remain and they remain miners till you know, either they died in the job or they retired, and uh, and it's about it's about class and art and politics and the meaning of art and and importantly, I suppose, who art is for. Mm -hmm. um, so there's loads and loads of themes which are very similar. It's Sounds like a great. prequel yeah. <laughs> to, to Billy yeah. Elliot. It seems yeah. to me that you you know for you art is. Art is what can transcend class. I, th I think it can. I th I'm, a, I'm a great believer in, in the, the transformative nature of art. Yes, but art think, can transcend all things, really, and not just class. Yeah, but I think it, it transform. It can transform. It can yeah. properly change. Yes. Uh, it, and it's a metaphor for politics yeah. as well as being the politics of transformation. Yeah. Um, I'm worried about transcending that it leaves class behind because I think it's important that you break down those restrictive structures that we live under and you change them and it's really exciting to be 
in America at this moment because of all that. Yes, um, indeed. All right, uh, we've got to wrap it up. Yep. All right, Lee Hall, uh, uh, Billy Elliot, uh, Lee Hall's movie and now musical on Broadway. It's a terrific show. Don't miss it at the Imperial Theater. Uh, great talking to you. Thanks for being our guest tonight. Thank, Thank you. you for coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> and one, and two, and three. And